this is just a slide to show everybody, and you guys know this, but a lot of people don't quite understand it. What's the difference between deficit and debt, right? The deficit is our annual gap between our revenues and our, and our expenditures. The debt is what stacks up year after year after year if you run a deficit. So in this simple example, $100 billion the first year, $200 billion of deficit, the next $50 billion in year three, that's going to end up with a debt of $250 uh, billion. And it'll actually be more than that because of the interest expense we incur. Okay? Next slide. As you can see, historically, this is showing deficit, not debt. The government has actually done a pretty decent job, except in wartime, of having a relatively um, uh, deficit-neutral budget. It's not perfect, but what's important to understand about this is any deficit that's above 3% of GDP, gross domestic product, uh, means that you're falling farther and farther behind because your, your borrowing costs uh, can't be recouped. Is this, and this idea is not original with me at all. And, and the idea here, which has floated around Washington for a long time but never been done, is to create, in order to further create discipline here, is to create a bipartisan group of people uh, that will help produce a set of, of suggested cuts and policies uh, that could lead us in the direction of the previous slide that I just talked about. And then it would force upon us a yes or no vote in the Congress, just like the Base Closing Commission, you know, which actually was very successful. It finally said, we're done with the politics of this. Let's put it in the hands of some people that can give us a reasoned view about how we should deal with it and to impose a discipline. So those are the, you know, I, and I'm open to other suggestions as you reflect on this or think about it. I'd love to have your thoughts, but directionally, this is where I'm headed on this question. I just wanted you to know it. All right. Okay. <coughs> can we move to health care? In this country, over the last eight or ten years or so, median family income has essentially been flat. It's actually in real dollars, in real dollars. The cost of health care for average families has gone up by over 80%. The cost of higher education has gone up by over 60%. Colorado, the numbers are a little different, but directionally the same. Median family income down by almost $800. Health care premiums up by over, you know, almost 100%, 97%. Higher ed costs up by 50%. If I look, think about that for just a second in terms of your business, right? If your revenue is flat over that period of time and your costs are going like this, for those two things, even before you get to we bought too many flat screen TVs, we did, you know, all this kind of stuff, your, your temptation to try to finance that by loading up on credit card debt, by loading up on home equity loans, starting to sound familiar because this is what we've been through. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and the minute that we, we stopped, the minute housing prices started to fall and banks said to themselves, oh my God, our loan portfolio may not be worth what we thought it was worth, uh, all lending ceased in the, in the economy. And actually, just if I can step back for a minute, I'll come back to this. It's and I know a lot of you guys know this, but it's really important when we're talking to our friends and neighbors about this, the hell that everybody's going through right now. What happened here? And what happened here is we were over levered at every level of our economy. The consumer, for whatever reason, but certainly partly because of that uh, uh, revenue cost curve split, uh, went from on average saving 7% of their net income, which is what we historically have done, to saving zero. But we got to do better than that for our kids, you know, because nobody does anything for 30 years anymore. No one. Why should we expect teachers to do the same thing for 30 years? And so there's no mystery to me why people, 50% of the people leave the profession in the first five years. I think the most important thing we can do is recognize that this isn't just about losing the race in mathematicians and engineers. It's about losing the race for people to teach people to become mathematicians and engineers. And if we're ever going to hope to be able to do that, we have to have the courage to be able to say we need to approach this very differently than, we, what, than, than we're approaching it today. And by the way, everything that I just said to you is not part of the discussion in Washington on, 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 on education, which is about, you know, on the one hand, more money, more money, more money on a system that isn't working. 
And on the other hand, let's have a really crude accountability system that's going to drive parents and teachers and kids completely crazy. That's our debate right now. I'm introducing legislation when I get back that looks at things like, that, that seeks to incentivize states and school districts to do things like experiment with their compensation system, experiment with alternative licensure so we can get the wisdom of people that have content knowledge in math and science, the STEM stuff you guys are talking about, has, and want to give back and bring it into the system uh, for the benefit of our kids. This is a place where we have been betting.